Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to be talking about two different planets in our solar system that seem to share the same property. No moons. And I wanted to explain why neither Mercury that you see right here nor Venus have any moons anymore. And the important emphasis here is on the word anymore, because it's very likely that they did have moons previously. Let's talk about this and welcome to What The Math. Many different objects in the solar system, and not just planets, have moons. For example, here's Haumea, the pictures of which were taken by Hubble telescope. Many different dwarf planets, including Pluto of course, have moons. And in case of Pluto, it has quite a lot of moons. So how is it that neither Mercury nor Venus have any? What makes these two objects unique and unusual? Well, in some of the previous videos a few years ago, I tried to explain this individually, but there are a lot of other things I didn't really explain in those videos, and today I wanted to combine all of them and explain them to you in two simple concepts related to orbital dynamics, and also briefly explain how all of this allows certain objects to have moons and other objects to have nothing, yet at the same time allowing some objects, like the other dwarf planet Haumea, to possess rings as well. So it all comes down to orbital dynamics and a lot of gravitational interactions. So first of all, both Mercury and Venus are slightly closer to the Sun, and in case of Mercury it's also a lot less massive than Earth. Here's how four of these objects compare to one another, and in case of Mercury it's actually easier to compare to our own Moon. It's about four and a half times as massive as the Moon of our planet, which is already kind of weird I guess. Mars, on the other hand, is roughly around 8 times as massive as the Moon, so both of these objects have a lot less gravity on the surface, which is also why they're not really that good at holding other objects in their orbits. But Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. Now, why is it that Mars has moons but Mercury doesn't? Well, one of the first questions we can ask here is, how do planets get moons? And right now we believe there are two main ways. One of the ways is by capturing moons, like for example, we believe that the vast majority of the smaller moons around Jupiter and Saturn, and also around Neptune and Uranus, are captured moons. They're moons that used to be asteroids or smaller objects, and eventually came too close and became captured. We also thought this was true for Mars, because its two moons are basically really really small, they're kind of similar to asteroids. Here's for example what Phobos looks like, it's really really small. But at the same time, we today think that this is not the case and they were most likely created as part of another way of acquiring moons, through a collision. In this case, we know so because the orbits of the moons seem to align with the rotation of the planet, meaning that they most likely were created when something really massive collided with Mars and most likely caused a lot of other effects. But first of all, it very likely had rings. These rings eventually solidified, creating a lot of smaller objects orbiting around Mars. Some of these objects probably fell back, some of them became transient moons, some of them became Phobos and Deimos. With time, a lot of this sort of either disappeared and fell back onto Martian surface, but some of them survived and became Phobos and Deimos. This illustration was created by the Royal Observatory of Belgium, and it kind of gives you a, a really good summary of how a lot of moons, including the moon orbiting our own planet, were created and how they eventually evolve into these permanent objects. But we also know that both Venus and Mercury also had a lot of collisions, and these collisions are especially apparent if you look at the surface of Mercury. It's pretty much covered in collision impacts. And some of these collisions definitely suggest that this planet had a very active past. Venus is probably no exception. At least one of these collisions would definitely create some sort of a moon around Mercury. But what happened to them? Well, like I said previously, we think that they did exist. It's very likely that they existed. But they just disappeared for two simple reasons. The proximity to the Sun and also this other really important feature that you can probably see right here in the simulation. The rotation of the planets is different, and this is really important when it comes to moons orbiting planets. As you can see here, both Earth and Mars have a relatively similar rotation speed. Earth does a single spin in 24 hours, roughly around 24 hours, and Mars does it in approximately 25 hours. On the other hand, neither Venus nor Mercury spin really fast. 
As a matter of fact, if we were to change this into one day being a single second, this is what it would all look like. These are really, really slow rotators. Now this plays a really important role when it comes to stability of moons. And here the best example is from our own moon. Because the moon and earth have a kind of a gravitational relation toward each other, the pull from the moon causes earth to have these two so-called tidal bulges. One of them is formed by the attraction from the moon, the other one is called by so-called inertia. Because of this, and because the moon has a lot less mass, eventually the moon actually became tidally locked to earth, which is why of course we always get to see the same side of the moon no matter where we are. If the moon was not tidally locked, it would sort of look like this and you would always get to see all sides. But earth is more massive, and for the moon to tidally lock the earth, it would take a lot longer, possibly up to about 10 billion years from now. And that's a really long time. And since earth is not tidally locked, it rotates and causes this tidal bulge to shift just a little bit, making it so that it's always in front of the moon. And all of this causes a little bit of pull on the moon's front side. This pull causes the moon to slowly accelerate, and because of this, the moon is slowly receding away from Earth, roughly around 3 centimeters or about 1 inch per year. Because of this, we today believe that once upon a time, moon was way, way closer, and also Earth was spinning much, much faster, about 4 times as fast. And because of this, we also believe that one day, moon may actually go beyond the ability of Earth to hold it and become its own body. Possibly, I guess, another planet or another dwarf planet orbiting around the sun. But what if the Earth was not spinning as fast and was spinning similar to Mercury and Venus? Well, in this case, the bulge would be actually behind the moon at all times, simply because the moon would be orbiting around faster than the spin of the planet. And this would obviously slow down the object, which is exactly why we believe all of the moons that existed around Mercury and Venus eventually fell back to the surface and most likely, at least for Mercury, created one of these beautiful spots on the surface. Now, we obviously don't really know which one it was, but technically, if we were to go to Mercury and investigate, we could probably find out by just looking at the impact caused by the collision. But since there are so many different craters to look at, it would be pretty difficult to discover which one it was, even though technically we should really only be looking at the craters on the equator. But could the moon have been much farther away from Mercury? Like, for example, could it be in orbit somewhere like a million kilometers away and still be there and we just don't see it? Well, here we come to the other feature we need to talk about, the so-called hill sphere. If we look at the gravitational parameters formed by the Sun and, for example, Earth that's right here, you can kind of see that because Sun has a lot more gravitational potential and it has obviously a lot more mass, it forms this unusual sphere around our planet known as Heliosphere, which is the only region around our planet where we can easily hold on to the moons and other objects. Beyond this Heliosphere, nothing really can stay in orbit and actually becomes part of the Sun's orbit. This Heliosphere around planet Earth is roughly around 1.5 kilometers in radius which is about one-fifth of the radius of where Moon is currently located. But for planets closer to the Sun, the heliosphere decreases in size. Here are some other objects for comparison, and you can see that for Venus it's about 1 million kilometers, for Mercury it's significantly lower. Which of course means that Mercury cannot really hold on to objects as easily as Earth, simply because the Sun just kind of steals them. And due to this, only close moons are possible around Mercury. But if the moon is too close to Mercury, within only a few hundred million years, and possibly even sooner than that, due to the relation I just described to you, due to the tidal interaction, it basically just falls back to the surface. So as it stands right now, there's really no way for Mercury to have a stable moon for longer than a few million years. It either disappears and becomes part of the Sun, or it becomes the property of the surface of Mercury. And pretty much the same applies to Venus, except here the story is a little bit more interesting because we don't think Venus was always spinning so slow. We think, at least we believe uh, from I guess the last few years or so, that the reason Venus spins so slow is actually because at some point it had a very unusual ocean on the surface 
so-called global ocean, that caused, due to the tidal effects from the sun, the planet to slowly spin slower and slower. And because of this effect, eventually Venus was spinning really slow, and we don't really know what happened next and what came first, whether the Venus heated up and the ocean disappeared, or whether if it had a moon, the moon started to slowly fall down and eventually caused the collision that then released all of this other stuff, forcing the Venus to become this hellish world where no life can technically survive. All of this is a mystery that we would like to solve because we would really like to find out if Venus became like this from being an Earth-like object due to the so-called runaway greenhouse effect, or if it was due to a collision from, for example, its own moon. And in order for us to learn all of this, we of course need to launch some sort of a mission that investigates this in a little bit more detail. But at the moment, even if we land on the surface, it's still going to be very, very difficult to find out because Venus has an extremely thick atmosphere that sort of erases all of the signs of previous collisions. So unfortunately, some mysteries may remain mysteries for a long time. But in a nutshell, this is why neither Venus nor Mercury have any moons. Although in case of Venus, since it does have a relatively large heliosphere, which is as I previously showed you around 1 million kilometers, it could potentially have a moon, a really small moon that's difficult to see, somewhere farther away, like up to about a million kilometers. This would be probably some sort of a captured object, and it would be somewhat difficult to find it. But this is of course hypothetical, and we don't really know if there's anything around it right now. Although chances are, if there is something, we are definitely going to discover it sometime in the next decade or so, simply because our telescopes have gotten so much better, and so many more amateur astronomers became interested in looking into the night skies and discovering new things. It could be you. For all we know, it could be you. But anyway, on that note, hopefully now you know a little bit more about both Venus and Mercury, and of course, tidal interactions between the objects, and why certain objects have moons and others don't. On that note, thank you for watching, I'll see you tomorrow, come back tomorrow to learn something else, subscribe if you still haven't, and share this with someone who loves learning about sciences, and maybe consider supporting this channel with Patreon, because it does help me quite a lot. Alternatively, you can also support this channel by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that you can also find in the description below. I'll see you tomorrow, space out, and as always, bye-bye.